Welcome back to part two of lecture eight on ancient Rome. We were talking about in the prior video how the patrician class tended to dominate the three branches of the Roman Republican government. This is going to generate quite a bit of resentment, as you might expect, among the numerically superior plebeian class or freedmen class. As early as the 490s BCE, in fact, they began threatening to withdraw from Rome and found a new city of their own if they were not granted more rights. This ongoing battle between the plebeians and patricians is sometimes termed the struggle of the orders, the various orders of society. And over the next 200 years, they will use this threat of withdrawing from Rome successfully to gain several new rights. More importantly, what we'll see is a step forward in defending the rights of plebeians is creating a written law code for the first time. The Twelve Tables, which is put forth in 451 BCE, will be the first written set of laws in Roman history. They had passed laws down orally, of course, for, for many generations, but this puts the plebeian or poorer classes at a disadvantage. If the patrician class decided to take away some of your rights, you had no way to stop that without a written constitution or a written body of laws to serve as a reference point. Now, just the fact that these laws are written down greatly benefits the poorer classes and helps keep them from being as exploited as they had in prior generations. In addition to some significant political changes under the Republic over time, culturally Rome was evolving in interesting ways as well. The city stood at a crossroads of several major trade routes and quickly became a major center, center for trade. As for daily life in the Roman Republic, society was rooted largely in the ancient social organizations of tribe, clan and family. A Roman was a member of a tribe and a clan as well as of their immediate family. And clan identification remained very strong over time, especially among the landowning classes, as did family identifications. Who you were, what family and clan you descended from, meant a tremendous deal. It determined what order you occupied in society, as well as governed who you associated with politically and socially. It even determined who you married. Indeed, the name of a male Roman citizen typically contained three components, with the first name being the name of an individual, like Gaius, Quintus, or Publius. Your second name was drawn from your clan association, Julius, Cornelius, or Fabus, for example, and your last name was derived from your family name from within that clan. Gaius, Julius Caesar, for example, the famous general and dictator who we'll be speaking much more about here soon, had the personal name of Gaius, the clan name of Julius, and the family name of Caesar. What this meant is when you met someone on a street corner in Rome and you exchanged pleasantries, as soon as you uttered your name, people are auto automatically locating you within this nexus of family and clan associations. They're figuring out by your name alone how influential you are. For example, by 100 BCE, it was nearly impossible for a man to become consul of Rome if his ancestors had not also been consuls. Another factor that determined your status in Roman society was your military rank. Rome was a society built on force and military conquest. For that reason, military service was mandatory for all Roman youth, at least for a period of time. Roman military training concentrated on instilling teamwork and maintaining a level head, all this above individual bravery. Troops were to maintain exact formations in battle, and there was brutal discipline for anyone who broke ranks. Uh, soldiers would be beaten to death, for example, for falling asleep on patrol duty or abandoning their post in battle. The Romans preferred the battle formation known as the legion, consisting of separate specialized units of fighters. And this strategy served Rome very well, as within 250 years only of throwing off Etruscan domination, they now had come to dominate Latium and the entire Italian peninsula. And Rome's military leadership was not content to stop there. They set their sights on the island of Sicily as their next target of domination. Unknown to them, however, a rising military rival to the south, the Carthaginians in North Africa, had already set their sights on the same prize, taking over the island of Sicily so that they could control trade between the eastern and western halves of the Mediterranean. During the 3rd century BCE, 
the Carthaginians began to attack the Greek city-states on the island of Sicily in a bid to control trade around the Mediterranean. The Greeks there could not defend themselves, and they appealed to their Roman neighbors to the north for help. This is how the first of the so-called Punic Wars begins. This is a standoff uh, between the Romans and the Carthaginians in North Africa. There were three separate engagements between these two powers. Um, to, for time's sake, I'm going to kind of condense it all and just give you the upshot of all these three rounds of fighting between the Romans and the Carthaginians. Rome will win in the end. And what will happen as a direct result of that is Rome now not only gets to take over Sicily, they get to take over Corsica and Sardinia, these two islands in the Mediterranean that had belonged to the Carthaginians in North Africa. They will gradually also take over the Iberian Peninsula, areas that again once had been under Carthaginian control, now is under Roman domination, and Rome will create even an overseas empire as a result of the Punic War. Across the Mediterranean Sea, they will come to take over territory in North Africa as they will eventually take down the capital city of Carthage itself, go door to door slaughtering anything that moves. They will set the city on fire and they will salt the soil as they leave to poison it as a testament to their hatred of the Carthaginians. Rome's leadership, emboldened by their success against the Carthaginians, will not stop there. They will move on to taking over the former Macedonian Empire and the Greek city-states. Parts of Asia Minor will be gifted to them. In 133 BCE, the king of Pergamon, uh, a longtime ally and admirer of Rome, when he passed away, he left his state to Rome. He just said, here, have this. So it would appear by the first century BCE that things were going very well for Rome. But we're already seeing some internal stressors, some cracks beginning to develop that will only widen and deepen over time that will begin to destabilize Rome from within. One of these destabilizing forces will be the rising number of slaves in Rome over time. These were largely drawn from captives of war or abandonment, and their numbers grew significantly over time as Roman armies began capturing more territory around the Mediterranean. For instance, 20,000 slaves were brought back from a campaign in North Africa in 256 BCE. 150,000 slaves were brought back to Rome from Epirus in 167 BCE. And allegedly, some 1 million were seized in Gaul, or present-day France, under Julius Caesar's victorious armies. As the number of slaves increases in Rome, so too will the number of slave uprisings, because no human wants to be exploited. In fact, by the time of Caesar Augustus, a famous Roman saying went along these lines, quote, Every slave we own is an enemy we harbor. So, the, uh, uh, the number of slaves will start to destabilize Rome over time, the number of uprisings associated with that. So, too, will the land question. What's going to happen with all this land or territory that has now come under Roman domination? Who will be the beneficiary of this land? Will it be the poor or will it be the wealthy? And I think you already know the answer to that. More on that in our next lecture.